peace and blessings. This is Misael Bay, aka Warlock Asylum, coming at you once again with another Simon Necronomicon lesson. All right, so I'd like to extend my greetings to everyone watching this and wants to thank everybody for their support thus far. Um, it's a learning process. I'm learning as it's going and, you know, with this text and system, there's so much to learn and it's an infinite learning system, something you can learn new every single day. So today, um, I want to touch on something because there was a, a question that was had by Brett Watts. And uh, let me see, I think it was under a recent lesson. Hold on, I don't want that to go off, but let me just see what was the question. Yeah, he put out there, excellent insight into such a great system. Maybe a video on protecting yourself and loved ones when entering the system. There seems like a potential danger working with deaf energy broken gates and etc. Okay, so let's talk about that then. Um, how can one avoid the potential dangers when first working with the Simon Necronomicon, right? Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this because a lot of people, you know, the, throw the idea of, of deaf energy out there is definitely serious. You don't want to take it lightly. Yet at the same time, what we also have to remember is that the world is living in the broken gate with deaf energy um, because of, just because of war and conquest and how certain religions were set up and, you know, the age of reason, how certain things became twisted and, and taken out over time. Uh, one great example of this is Christianity where, you know, you look in the Bible and, uh, you know, every, Every single book in the Bible talks about the destruction of human beings. There's a gate open, and these are deaf deities, you know. So um, that's something that's 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 not really talked about. I look from that perspective, but I look at it from that perspective. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of other people do, um, but popularly in the view of the media, it's not. But that's that thing. Let's just talk specifically more about the Simon Necronomic and how that works. And I want to share my screen. We'll be doing like a lot of sh screen sharing over the course of the next few months. And today I'm gonna be looking into the Book of Calling because that's gonna help us out a lot in understanding. I think that certain fears come up because the text is not understood. No one's going to understand the text during their first walking. No one's going to understand the text entirely, ever, you know, um, because to understand the text is to understand life, you know, in a lot of different ways, uh, especially when you're dealing with this realm and other realms. So that's a, a huge, tremendous field of study. However, that's not the important thing to get started. The important thing to get started is just understand the basic ground rules. And the only way that one can really get to that is understanding why the text, what does the text lead to? Well, like every other text, the Simon Necronomicon leads to um, mass, you know, cultivating oneself spiritually, reaching one's highest potential, and it could possibly open the door to immortality. And this is what we'll discuss today because this is the proper use of deaf energy. If we go to the Book of Calling, let me see if I can share my screen on this part. Okay, it's coming up. There we go. We can see in the first section, it says, this is the book of the ceremonies of calling, handing down since the time that the elder gods walked the earth, conquerors of the ancient ones. Okay, so that tells us, in a nutshell, what was going on. Um, it wasn't no aliens. These were human beings, human magicians, who were able to um, go through certain initiations and get to a level of integration with the death energy 
And for that reason, when you look at what or how people define a God, um, it can mean many things, you know. But one of the things it means mostly to people is the ability to heal them and the power to wield death energy. So when you look in books like the Bible, as mentioned before, in every single book of the Bible, for the most part, I would say 90% of them, if someone's getting destroyed, a group of people getting destroyed, it's always promising mass destruction because this is the power that gods have learned to wield, you know? And um, this is what uh, Necronomicon offers in this initiation algamation is that if you um, are able to merge yourself with that realm, you've conquered fear because that's one of the biggest fears in life is death. And if you're able to merge with that, um, it's almost like invincibility. You know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of times when that word is used around, people often think of the most morbid experience. And that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about the energy where life is moving to. All life is moving into this direction. So it doesn't matter if you work with the energy or not. You're just, you're moving in that direction. The only difference is that the magician understands that and is able to acknowledge it and utilize such in his life for the betterment of his personal experience and his community. And that's it. It's nothing like everyone comes into contact because that's where everyone's going. Life is going. That's where the universe is going. That's where gods are going. When people forget about them, they die. Everything is going into this portal, right? So the uh, rites of Kerr was a personification of this space. Um, it's not something... Uh, to be like uh, avoided because that's the only live out of fear but to understand that basically when you're dealing with death energy the biggest thing you want to remember is that you're dealing with the energy of change and that's what it represents um, in, in that realm it doesn't really represent like taking a gun and shooting somebody you know um, that's not what that represents. It represents the energy of change. There's something here I thought that might be good to look at. It's mentioned in a couple of books that uh, I've worked with and some I even authored. And this is taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica, ironically, in the year uh, 1911. Let me see if I can find this. Hold on. Let me just cancel the share screen mode because let me see where I put this at on a computer. But um, okay, I see. That's what I thought. All right. So let me try this again. Share screen. Okay, here we go. And. We pull this back, almost there. And basically, you can see on the top, it says the Encyclopedia Botanica, a dictionary of art, science, literature, and information. And this has come out the Encyclopedia Botanica. It says, they may, it is true, be associated with ghost gods. But in Australia, it cannot even be asserted that the gods are spirits at all, much less that they are spirits of dead men. They are simply magnified magicians, supermen who have never died. We have no ground, therefore, for regarding the cult of the dead as the origin. In this area, this conclusion is the more probable as ancestor worship and the cult of the dead generally cannot be said to exist in Australia. I don't know if I necessarily agree with those comments, but one thing we do see is that we see the... Um, idea that gods were at one time magicians, magnified magicians. And that's the same thing that the Book of Calling is telling us, that this book was handed down 
so that it was handed down for those who follow the path of the elder gods to become elder gods. If you look throughout all of Chaldea and the Mesopotamian experience, the only literature you're going to see on the academic level is the religion that one is a devout worshiper of a deity, right? In the economic, it also talks about that as the priest of Enki. But there's another right where this person evolves into a um, a uh, a deity. You know what I'm saying? You know themselves. You know, and it talks about that in the introduction, which is uh, very profound. The Necronomicon prepares the person through the gate walking system. If he knows the mad Arab didn't walk any gates, he just lit a candle by a rock, and, and that was the rock of his initiation. And he said that he developed, you know, further parts of the text on the plains of the Agigi. Okay, so the Necronomicon, and it's probably why its name is titled what it is, is basically about um, the cult of the dead. So what happens is that through each gate, you know, a watcher is invoked in each gate, you know, like not a different watcher, but the watcher and the right of the watcher is invoked as one is going through each gate and they're building their astral. But as we discussed before, and as can, as can be seen in the Conjuration of the Watcher book, in a normal invocation, incantation, the watcher is um, a piece of cur. Right, so this means that as a person is going up through the, the gates, they're getting a little piece of energy and just dealing with a little bit of it. Right, then they go into the next gate, they're dealing with a little bit of it. You see what I'm saying? And that's um, the the um, the key to being able to open the eighth gate. And if you look in the, the gates of the Necronomicon book by Simon, he mentions that opening the eighth gate, no one could really expect or could explain what may or may not happen. So that tells us that opening the eighth gate is not really opening up a door. It's really opening up Ganzia, like opening up the practice. You see what I'm saying? And then you know, that question Brett led to, it actually leads to a secret, although I haven't really fully uh, comprehended the whole thing completely as far as like how the working would exactly go. But it's a possibility that that's where the calling and the ceremonies of calling happens because he mentioned certain traps to hide the book's technology. But if you read the Arab's text, the testimony of the mad Arab, he didn't do anything in the mad, there's nothing in the mad Arab's testimonies that the testimonies illustrate how the text works, where he set up the watchtowers and things. And then when you read about the watchtowers, it almost as if it is in Ganzia because you're talking to each direction and saying, hey, you know, we don't want to see Hamawa, you know, or other energies that are associated with the Urilla text. So perhaps both rites are accessed through the gate, right? And this is what, you know, is sort of suggested in other books like Gates of Necronomicon, where he says that the underworld can be in heaven or it could be on the earth. So that means that if that's the case, maybe that's access through the gate of Ganzi also. And the walking is a preparation for that. And then even in the walking, it says as far as the instructions that one should read the section in the sleep of Ishtar of how she ascended out of the gate, right? And another thing it says, and this is something I learned through practices of purification right, was that normally when I had gotten into the system, you know, we got used to walking every full moon. It was a discussion of what gate you walk and stuff. And I learned later that that wasn't correct, you know, that you should just walk the gates and, and that sort of thing. And then after that, you deal with the calling. But in the last section of the gates of the Necronomicon book by Simon, 
He says that the full moon is for initiation, yet those who are planning to work with the ceremonies of calling would have waited to the dark moon. So I was like, wow. So what happens is the walking is on the full moon, and then once a person is initiated, they do the calling on the new moon when the stars are present. Right, and that tells you what the right really is, because when you look at the seal of Ganzia, no recourse can be had into the light of the moon. Really, it, it's showing you how to practice a certain thing without being afraid of it, you know, and and working gradually with it in time. It's definitely a phenomenal, phenomenal system and equally intense. You know what I'm saying, and um, it's it, it it's a knowledge of an old right. So, you know, the symbolisms and the explanations of what it means really are not in public view. You know, things like finding out the history of Anana or Inki or you know Anu; those things are in public view. But really you know, opening up that door, as he mentions, that gate, that's not in public view. You know, um, there's not a lot of information on that. There's a lot of speculative information, but there's nothing concrete. But a lot of things can actually be learned from traditions that exist today that also deal with that realm. Now, the on the other side of the coin, um, as mentioned in the earlier part of the, 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 the um, Simon Economicus introductory notes, um, a person doesn't have to open that door. They can remain in the inner system, the inner solar system, and, you know, they can work with things that are quote unquote lighter. You know, actually, they may even adjust the watch calling. Maybe they want to deal with her at all. And, that's a personal choice, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's for the individual to uh, deal with. One thing I would say, however, is that um, I did the walking, you know, I, I I did walking as much as any way I know could do because I walked everything in the book and then walked it backwards for us. Cause we was, you know, you, you're kind of young, you went to the method. And, um, you know, I started wondering why, you know, certain things just wouldn't respond through a different way than the walking, right? And I got into, you know, straight Suma stuff, like the Oracle of Enhedwana and stuff. And when I had did, because this brings up another conversation I had with someone else, the prayer to every God, when I did it for seven days, and at the time I was just using Sumerian stuff, what came up was the necro, and it came up strong. Like, you got to work with that, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of interesting. Um, but as time goes, you'll understand more and more what could be included and what can't be. You know, because um, certain things, you know, like it's mentioned by the authors, there are traps. So certain things, you know, once you figure it out, it's like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to include that, you know what I'm saying, into my work or whatever. But in the beginning, if you follow the instructions and gates and economic and you will be good, death energy is not like that. Oh, man, we, you know, this time we're going to kill you. It, it doesn't, it, it's not affected by any of those things because everything is going into the space of death. So it's not possessive because it's, you already are going into that space. Every breath you take, you're closer to that space. You know, so everyone's going into Kerr. You're going into that space. You see what I'm saying? So the thing is, if you can learn to alchemate yourself, now and understand the power of Enki. See what the elder gods did. It took me a long time to figure this out. Also, they made a space for themselves outside of Kerr. That's what the whole thing is about. The battle of 
uh, Tiamat and stuff like that. They made a space for themselves outside of that space that they can enjoy life and this, that, and the other. And it was made through the power of Inki. So Inki, you know, this is why in the text, in the Necro, that appears very strongly. Because once you gain favor with the upper gods, then a person, you know, Inky can grant you the gift of moving in and out the netherworld freely, right? The thing with the door, um, as mentioned in the Book of Calling, is that usually when that's open, you don't want to leave that open. That's the thing. Possibly you can get to do it in ceremonies. And I'll tell you my experience. When I first walked the gates, I got up to Marduk and I went into the pit similar to like a tree of lifestyle and basically during that time i just felt the need to purge just to purge it just felt like i had a knot of tears boiled up inside of me and i just wanted to go someplace and just cry you know and then i went into a door and the feeling that i had was that like my sins were forgiven because the wages sins pays as death and that's another that's another aspect. When you are in, when you are a magician of Kerr, you're a priest of Inki in that sense because Inki is like rule of the crossroads. So you can kind of see two ways in everything. Um, you know, it's it's really, 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 very interesting. But as a priest of Inki and working with Kerr and all that sort of stuff, you really gain a lot of insight into life that's just so much more different, you know, um, so much more fulfilling. Um, but it's not something in the true sense of the term of morbid. It's just slightly outside the earthly preview. But Inki... Like in the cases of Nagal and other energies, he was able to provide a seat that a person can go in and they can go out. You know, um, that was my experience going into Ganzia from the perspective of initiation. After I got into Adar and other places, um, I got into the the Urilla text. You know what I'm saying? I never knew. It was a little risky, so to speak, because I didn't know anyone who ever had did it. And um, I started reading it, reading it, reading it, contemplating it. And really, to be honest with you, that information it shouldn't be too loose for those who know the formula. Because when I got into it, um, it came to me like this is not for everybody. And it's sort of for people who want to do the right thing. You know, that's why you're allowed entrance into that world, because you're going to do the right thing. And this is another thing. <clears throat> the Necronomicon is, a, is an entrance into a lodge. Simon talks about it as a secret society. And usually it takes a long time to meet its invisible members physically. You know, and that's real talk. It takes a long time. But you, a person, if they keep working, when they talk about seeing something in beholdable form, they will meet someone from that realm. And it's all about guidance, direction, and getting you to a better place. When I've met the energies that rep the Necronomic and outside the, the, the aesthetics of some foolishness, these people were like so innocent that you will worry about them. You know what I'm saying? They didn't seem to hold any vice. Very calm, peaceful individuals, somewhat childlike as adults, or even older than me. You know, and so that gave me like a deeper insight. Um, if anything, the place that you want to really reach for through the gate is the agigi, because that's the perpetual right of 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 the adept. You know, um, but as far as like, you know, those things, a lot of those things are like assigned to the, a certain lodge and that governs a certain crew of individuals. The problem is, is that 
a lot of people have taken the neck as a system of Western magic. So it just becomes, how can it be chaos? It's not chaos, and that's what they're taking it as. So they don't really get it because they already have this idea in their head that they're trying to apply to the text. So they can't learn what it really means, right? And then, um, you know, they're just doing all sorts of foolishness with the book um, as if it's like a piece of chaos magic. How can it be chaos magic when you have the rules in the book calling and you also have a gate system of initiation. That's not chaos magic. Is this something like, hey, I want to work with this today, but I'm not committed to it, and I want to work with that tomorrow, but I'm not committed to that either, and see what I can get out of it. And if I don't get anything out of it, I'll leave them alone. That's chaos magic. Very simple. A lot of things that are called chaos magic is just done so because of jealousy. You know what I'm saying? You think about it. You can be a part of all these magical groups and stuff, and a lot of them are just about camaraderie. They don't really have anything going on. It's just like Halloween. Let's play make-believe and dress up. And then you come across some stuff that's really on some real stuff. And, you know, people get afraid of it or whatever, or they say it's fictional, it's a hoax. I had a comment earlier, you know, and it wasn't an ignorant comment. It was it was a good question, actually. But I've heard the question before. And the question was, hey, you know, wasn't this something that Lovecraft made up? Possibly. Robots is something that love, you know, that came out of fiction. The word Android came out of fiction. But no one's going around telling people who are making sex bots and life partners that that's not real because it came out of a fictional book. It's normal to take a term out of a fictional text and apply it to academic science. And this in that practice that the academic community of science uses is actually a practice that came from alchemy. Right? You have eighty eight terms minimum that exist in science that came out of fictional texts. So the idea that we're using a term that came out of a fictional text doesn't mean that we're working with Lovecraft's idea or that we believe in something that a fictional writer said. No, we're applying the term for alchemical purposes because it does simulate a resemblance to the working. And that's it. You know what I'm saying? In the discussion, once you realize that the people who go around, oh, that's Lovecraft, love, you, they're more fanatical, if anything, you know? So this is not about that. This is about serious science, and this stuff is, is very transformative, and that's what the term death energy means, transformative. It could also leave you on the curve. But mostly it's transformative. And the reason why it could leave someone on the curve is because they're disrespectful. It, this is, was seen in the case of um, Ishtar's ascent into the underworld. If you notice, the only people who are seduced to death energy are those people who are disrespectful. Right? What does it mean to be disrespectful in necronomic in terms? It just means taking the tone and playing with it. You know, in a way that's disrespectful. That's it. If a person practices the text and they put down the text, right, and don't practice it anymore, that's not disrespectful. You see what I'm saying? And those energies will still be with that person. You see what I'm saying? That's just a person trying to find themselves in the free. And guess what? It doesn't matter because everybody's going to occur anyway. You know what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't, the thing is, is that when you alchemate with Kerr, because remember Simon says this in the beginning of the book, he says this about Marduk, that all these deities were going into the underworld. Even if you look into other stories, Christianity, Shinto, all the creative deities went through the underworld. Why? Because once you alchemate with death energy, it gives you innate powers that cannot be achieved by other means. What do I mean by that? For example, 
why people want to get down and curse each other and stuff, I really don't understand because they could use that energy in a lot of different ways. However, if we're going to talk about that, let's say someone who's been through initiation in the Necronomicon, usually if someone sends them something like a curse, it usually turns out to be a blessing because deaf energy can absorb it. And this is why Bruce Lee said, I want to be like water, because water, it can change forms. You can't punch water. It's the same thing with death energy. So the goal of the initiation of the Simon Necronomicon is for the priest or the priestess to become a Santa Murte unto themselves just to make it clear, like I had to bring that in, you know, um, but that's kind of the idea of what it means is to bring, to actually be that living in the world. And then when the physical body passes, you move on in that lane, you know what I'm saying? But those things is kind of things to seriously think about, you know what I'm saying? But ultimately that's what that means. It's not anything negative. There's a lot of light deities that, you know, people consider celestial deities, I should say, and celestial deities, they're going into Kerr also. Everything is going into moving into the realm of death with time, right? Um, the thing with celestial deities is sort of like the New Age movement because, it, you know, it seems bright and stuff, but there's a trigger of illusion, like the sun rising, the sky is not blue, you know what I'm saying? Um, things of that nature. Sun is not rising or setting. Those are all illusions. But at night, you could see where you're at in the universe. Um, you could tell, you know, you could tell the reality of things. So to see in the darkness is a great gift because all you're doing is looking at truth. You know what I'm saying? And that's what a lot of people don't get. You know, there's a, a real, a lot of strong and powerful analogies from that realm. And also within that realm exists a celestial section. So it's not, because when you look at it, everything came out of that. Everything came out of death and everything returns to it. That's what I mean, some dust you out of dust you return. Everything came out of that. Tiamat gave birth to all the gods. You see what I'm saying? So. And Tiamat, you know, as mentioned in the Economican, is more than likely the other name for Arishkigal, which rules Kerr. So everything came out of that. Everything is returned into that. But once that is acknowledged, you see what I'm saying? Once it's worked with, that becomes a part of your consciousness. And that's why you live forever. You see what I'm saying? Because ultimately, that's the only thing that lives forever. And this is why in the Necronomicon, it says that which is new came from that which is old. And that which is old uh, shall replace what is new. And once again, the ancient ones will rule. That is what that text means. People don't get it. That's entirely what that means. Is everything came out of death. And death will replace that. You can see it in the seasons. You can see it in uh, Son to the Father. It, it's everything. is So once you become conscious of that and you work through that consciousness, then your consciousness is eternal. And that's the secret. There are formulas in the neck that accomplish that, but that's ultimately the secret. Even in Manly Pease Hall's work, it mentions the importance of becoming a living shade. The problem is, is that when people hear that sort of thing, they think of like something that's decaying. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the, the current of energy itself. And wow, it's, it's really to explain to a novice, it's a little difficult because it doesn't live in the expanse. You see what I'm saying? It's just a place of being. So even when Ishtar came down and she wanted to do some things or whatever, they're like, look, man, you got to obey the covenant. There's no if ands about, about it. So Inki was revered as the high lord because he was able to break that. Marduk was able to break that. So 
they handed that text to us. And the only way that a person can achieve immortality is through those same methods, is by merging into his consciousness and existing through that way. If you watch The Matrix, that's the same thing that happened. This dude was going around. He was plugging up people, Mr. Smith. And so what Neil did was figure out, like, nah, man, I can't stop this. But what I can do is I can merge with his consciousness and then utilize that energy for a progressive aim, you see. And, and that's what the idea is, is once you merge into that consciousness, you know, you can move, you can motivate progressively. You see what I'm saying? And you lay the game, the, the gifts of both worlds, the land of the Agigi and the lower worlds. You see what I'm saying? And that's, that's the beautiful thing. You become that star. You create your own orbit after that. But you no longer have to fear um, being taken away to this other world without any consciousness, with losing all memory at the shock of death, things of that nature, because you understand that reality and how it rules people. And those are lessons that just can't be in the book, but they can appear before you in life. You see what I'm saying? The economic it actually goes beyond the death realm. Right. But initially in initiation, what happens is you're led to that so that you can transform that to something that is totally uh, oblivious to modern day alchemist. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's a beautiful thing, but it's still layered in the void. You see what I'm saying? Everything is still going into the void. So what the elders did was built a space that was outside that. But here's the thing. Even when you read the Sumerian epics, you notice that Inky built his house on top of the Absu. What was the Absu? You see what I'm saying? So death is just the entrance into a door that leads to other things and that's why he talks about the gate that leads to the outside because the outside is the outside of this circumvented reality once you see the outside there are many things that you can get evolved but a lot of people go into that a will unconsciously you see what i'm saying and the necronomic can teach you how to awaken to make choices and to move on and to even transform your life into something greater through the door of death. You see what I'm saying? And um, that's all we have for today. This is Misal Bay, aka Warlock Asylum, and I hope you enjoyed this lesson from the Simon Necronomicon. I'm going to say good night and have a good evening. I'll check you later.